Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for joining us on Vilayat News. I'm Abru Sabzwari. And now to the top headlines for today. Ex-CIA spy agency contractor Snowden is still at the airport. Ecuador asylum decision may take months. Syrian rebels lose border town as Syria's death toll tops 100,000. Egypt's President Mohamed Morsi warns unrest risks country's paralysis. Fresh protests take place in Brazil despite government concessions. Jordan's king warns against sectarian strife in Syria, calling it a recipe for destruction. Armed groups clash in the Libyan capital for the second day. 71 prisoners have died due to brutal torture techniques in Israeli jails. And now, the news in detail. A former U.S. spy agency contractor facing charges of espionage remained in hiding at a Moscow airport on Wednesday while the prospect grew of a protracted Russian-U.S. wrangle over his fate. Edward Snowden has requested asylum in Ecuador where a decision could take up to months and asked Washington to argue its case for extradition. Russia said Snowden was still in the transit area of Shermetievo Airport. He fled to Hong Kong after leaking details of secret U.S. government surveillance programs and then flew on to Moscow on Sunday. There was no sign on Wednesday of him registering for onward flights out of Russia. The logical route for Snowden to take out and one for which he at one point had a reservation would be an Aeroflot flight to Havana and a connecting flight to Ecuador. The choice of alternative flights while the United States presses other countries not to take him in or to arrest him on arrival would appear to be limited. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov repeated Putin's stated opinion that he should choose a destination and fly out as soon as possible. Snowden, with his surveillance information, remains within the grasp of a Russian state, clearly not in a hurry to dispatch him from its territory. Ecuador, which has not in the past flinched from taking on Western powers, is similarly not rushing to banish the uncertainty now plaguing U.S. authorities. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad's forces have retaken a town on the Lebanese border as they press an offensive against rebels in a conflict that has now cost more than 100,000 lives. The army took full control of Tel Kalakh, driving out insurgents and ending an unofficial truce under which it had allowed a small rebel presence to remain for several months. The fall of Tel Kalakh, two miles from the border within Lebanon, marks another gain for Assad after the capture of the rebel stronghold of Qusair this month and consolidates his control around the central city of Homs. Like Qusair, Tel Kalakh was used by rebels in the early stages of the conflict as a transit point for weapons and fighters smuggled into Syria to join the fight against Assad. The British-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, a pro-opposition monitoring group, said rebels left the town on Tuesday retreating towards the nearby crusader fort of Croc de Xavier in response to Assad's gains achieved with the supporters of Lebanon's pro-Iranian Hezbollah fighters Western and Arab nations pledged on the weekend to send urgent military aid to the rebels Hezbollah's involvement has highlighted the increasingly sectarian dynamic in the Syrian conflict Hezbollah and Tehran back Assad while Sunni Muslim states such as Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Qatar have stepped up support for the mainly Sunni rebels. Radical Sunni militants from abroad, some of them linked to Al-Qaeda, are also coming into fight alongside the rebels. Saudi Arabia, which views Shia Iran as its arch rival, has stepped up aid to Syrian rebels in the recent months, supplying anti-aircraft missiles among other weapons. Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi has warned that continuing unrest is threatening to paralyze the country. In a televised speech marking his first year in office, Mr. Morsi said he had made some mistakes since becoming president. Troops have been deployed across Egyptian cities ahead of planned weekend protests demanding his removal. Ahead of Mr. Morsi's speech, deadly clashes broke out in the northern city of Mansoura. Two people were killed and 170 others injured in fighting between the supporters 
and opponents of the government. Mr. Morsi took power on 30th of June 2012. His first year in office has been marred by constant political unrest and a sinking economy. Speaking on Wednesday evening, President Morsi promised to introduce immediate and radical reforms in state institutions. He said the polarization of politics in Egypt had reached the stage where it risked destabilizing the entire nation. Mr. Morsi added that he had done his best to evaluate the situation during the past year, adding that he would build on the positives and address the negatives. Tensions in Cairo have been rising ahead of the demonstrations planned for the weekend, with counter demonstrations by Islamists in support of Mr. Morsi planned for the coming days. Tens of thousands of Brazilians took to the streets on Wednesday in new demonstrations calling for a crackdown on corruption and better public services. This comes just a day after Congress ceded to some of the key demands galvanizing protests across the country. In Belo Horizonte, some 50,000 people gathered to demand improved education and health care as Brazil's third largest city hosted a Confederations Cup semi-final soccer game between Brazil and Uruguay in a warm-up for the two 2014 World Cup. Hooded youths threw stones at police who used tear gas to stop marchers one and a half miles away from the stadium. In Brasilia, demonstrators kicked soccer balls over a police cordon in the direction of Congress in a peaceful protest against the billions of dollars Brazil has spent building new stadiums for the global tournaments, which the protesters say should have been used instead to improve public services, including health, education, and transport. Almost two weeks after a wave of discontent suddenly erupted into Brazil's biggest protest in 20 years, the country's shaken political leadership is scrambling to respond to popular pressure for change. Jordanian King Abdullah II has warned that sectarian strife in Syria will have devastating consequences. The Jordanian king, whose country is home to around 550,000 Syrian refugees, stated that a divided Syria means an open-ended conflict that would undermine the stability of the region and the future of its people for generations to come. He added that dividing Syria is not in anyone's interest and tampering with Syria's unity is a recipe for destruction. The Jordanian monarch also warned against exporting the conflict to the wider region, saying that fanning the fire of sectarianism in the Arab and Islamic worlds will have devastating consequences for generations to come and on the entire world. The sum of all fears is that the Syrian conflict could expand into a sedition between the regions Sunnis and Shias. He also noted that we cannot remain silent over attempts to tamper with the destiny of the region and its peoples by exploiting religion and religious schools for politics and use them as a means to divide people. At least two people were killed and 24 wounded in clashes between militias in Libya's capital Tripoli on Wednesday, highlighting the rivalries behind heavily armed groups that have plagued the country since the fall of Muammar Gaddafi. Loud explosions and gunfire rocked Tripoli's southern neighborhoods the second day of violence in the battle-scarred city. Armed groups made up of former rebel fighters from different parts of the country have grown in power and ambition nearly two years after Gaddafi was ousted and the government has struggled to impose its authority over them. The latest fighting started on Tuesday morning when a militia, given the job of guarding a major Libyan oil field, attacked the headquarters of the national body set up to guard oil facilities across the country. The group from the western town of Zintan was disgruntled after another group was given supervision of a drill in the area. The fighting that triggered widespread resentment in Tripoli against fighters from Zintan and by Wednesday parts of the city were caught in fighting between people from that town and other areas. Underlining the complexity of the situation, Wednesday's violence pitted a separate group from Zintan against fighters from the Tripoli-based Supreme Security Committee, SSC. The Palestine Prisoner Center for Studies charged the Israeli Occupation Authority, IOA, with practicing systematic torture against Palestinian prisoners with full authorization by the judicial system. It said in a statement on Tuesday that the General Committee Against Torture received 900 complaints from liberated prisoners over the past few years detailing their torture at the hands of the Israeli jailers, who were not prosecuted or interrogated about such practices. It also charged charged the Israeli judiciary with complicity as none of the interrogators was investigated over the use of cruel interrogation means. 
The center in a report on the occasion of the International Day Against Torture said that the IOA was legalizing torture without any humanitarian consideration. It said that the brutal torture techniques and practice led to the martyrdom of 71 prisoners. أجلسوني على كرسي مربوط اليدين إلى الخلف بقيود حديدية وربطوا رجلي بثنتين برجلين الكرسي وبلشوا يدفعوني إلى الخلف حيث إنه أنثني بشكل يو ولكن إلى الخلف بعد هيك المحقق اللي وراي ويبلش يضغط على صدري لحين ما يوصل راسي لعند مؤخرة رجلي من وراء طبعا في هاي اللحظات بختل توازن الجسم يعني كنت أحس إنه في حرارة عالية في دوخة في يعني اختلال يعني بالمرأة كل جسمي بختل استمرت عملية كزعة الموزة للخلف عشرات المرات طبعا وكل أربع ساعات يبدلوا شفت محققين جداد بعد العشرات المرات اللي بيستخدموها كل يوم بشكل متواصل ولا بشكل متواصل اثناء الليل اثناء الليل والنهار انا يعني بتحدث عن الجمعه بعد الظهر للثلاثه بالليل انا قاعد على الكرسي قاعدي وحدي بعد كزعه الموزه وهي التهديدات كلها يحلوني من الكرسي ويقعدوني قاعده الكرفصاء على رؤوس اصابعي رجلي كانوا يحطوا في انفي كلاليب حديد معلقة في محل مخصص إلها على أساس إنه ما أقدرش أنزل وأنا قاعد على رأس أصابعي وإذا بدي أوقف كانت إيد المحقق فوق راسي على أساس يضرب بقوة مشان أنزل ما بعد هيك بعد أن يتكرر هذا الحكي يستمر لمدة ساعة كانوا لما يرفعوني من هذه الكعدة يرفعوني من شعر راسي لدرجة إنه في فترة من الفترات صار عندي الصلع تام في مقدمة الرأس ما بعد هيك المحقق يمسك الكلفشات بايديه الثنتين ويضغطهن فيما بين اجريه بقوه حيث انه كانت الكلفشه تسكر على الاخر وكانت تلف وتدخل في اللحم في بعض الاحيان كانوا يجوا يفتحوها بالمفتاح ما تفتحش لانها مضغوطه على الاخر فيلجأوا لمقصات الحديد مشان يقصوا كلفشة الحديد من إيدي استمر التحقيق العسكري معي لثلاث أيام متواصلة في اليوم الثالث أجاني محققين اثنين من بيت احتقبة كزعوني كزعة الموزة وصاروا يضغطوا على صدري كالعادة المحقق رفع رجله عن صدري فجأة هكالي أنت مش لازم تعيش وضغط على صدري بقوة شعرت أنه في في ظهري إشي صوت كسر أغمي علي مصحيت شو ما عرفت شو البذور حولي صحيت صحوا فيا وكان راسي بعده من نحو الأرض موجه ما رفعوني بعد ما صحيت رفعوني أقعد عاد الألم من من جديد عندي بالنسبة لي في الكسر وأغمي علي مرة أخرى فصحوني وطلبوا مني إني أوقف أنا رديت على المحقق إنه أنا مش شاعر إنه إلي جرين أوقف عليها صفك المحقق وضحك بصوت عالي وكان إن شليت قلت له أنا هذا اللي شاعر فيه كان هو هذا اللي كان مطلوب And that brings us to the end of our bulletin today. If you'd like to contribute your community's news, you can email us at news at You can also get the latest headlines and more by logging on to our website, vilayatv.org, or follow us on our YouTube and Facebook pages, Vilayat TV USA. Many thanks for joining us. Till next time, I'm Abru Sabzwari.